something that, as you guys probably are aware of, if you're watching the news, is there's a lot going on in Louisiana. And something that's really cool, though, is by you guys giving through Aspire Church, um, we've been able to help. And there are 10,000 trucks that Send Relief has already sent to the Louisiana area to help out and give the people over there relief. So thank you for your giving. Thank you for being a part of that. And remember, as you give to Aspire Church, you're actually giving through Aspire Church to help out with things that are going on, you know, over the world in our country. Um, so thank you for that. So there's um, a few other things that we have going on. We have two uh, events coming up that I want you guys to be aware of. One is on September 19th at 6 o'clock. So if you are interested in becoming a member of Aspire Church, or you don't really know what that entails and what that means, you can join us for the Discovering Aspire class at Pastor Brian's house at 6 p.m. September 19th. And then second, this Wednesday, we're starting the Rational Belief class that we've been talking about. So for those of you who maybe have doubts or have questions, um, this is a really good class to get to know how to logically and see how God is the answer to everything. Um, and if you have doubts about what I just said, then you can be part of that class and actually see and walk through that. And it's a class that you'll be able to ask whatever questions you want. If you have doubts, you can ask those things and you can discuss it. That's starting this Wednesday. And even for those of you who maybe have a lot of friends who um, have those doubts and you want to be able to better talk to them, I mean, it, yeah, we are asking a commitment of a few weeks um, if you join this class, but it will give you that, that logical step on how you get to God. Today we're going to be talking about something I think um, it may sound a little morbid, but it's going to happen to all of us. What's going to happen at our funeral? What are we going to talk about? I do a lot of funerals. I do a lot of funerals. I haven't done very many recently, which is good. Isn't that good? It's good for you, right? Because I'd be doing yours, right? So it's good for you. But we all are going to have a funeral at some point. Unless Jesus comes back, we're going to have something. And people are going to say stuff about us. Today we're going to talk about what are they going to say. I've always found it interesting. Some funerals are actually tremendously um, uplifting for me to do. I know that sounds strange, but it is such an honor to be able to Talk about people that have lived a life well and be able to go and to tell people about Jesus Christ. And so today, um, if you're an unbeliever, if you um, are, are still coming to our church learning more about what it means to be a Christian, let me encourage you to do something. I encourage you to get online um, today and email Dan Hodges and sign up for the Rational Belief class. The, uh, the message today may not have a lot of impact on you. It might. But for the most part, this is a message today for those of us that call ourselves Jesus followers and everybody else, you're kind of listening in. But I encourage you, those of you that have been coming to church on a regular basis and you still have not given your life to Christ, Dan Hodges is one of the best apologists that I know of. He's a member of our church. He's been in North Carolina for the last few months and he's doing a Zoom call. He can take as many as 50 people, by the way. Uh, we said five or to seven, but he can take as many as 50 people and he will have special guests that will jump on um, that that, that Zoom call. Let me just tell you this. It is God's gift to you if you don't know Jesus to be able to have somebody that will sit with you every single week and ask, ask to answer the questions you might have. That's a gift from God. And so you may not look at it that way, but it is. It's a gift from God because today we're going to talk about what we believe as Jesus followers will happen someday. We will all uh, say our goodbyes. Now some of us won't even, you know, I, I, I'm not going to care about my funeral that much, but I do want Jesus exalted, wouldn't you agree? We want Jesus to be exalted. We want some things to be said about us, and not so much at the funeral itself, but there are some things that we, we should be known by. Wouldn't you agree? There are some things as you look back on your life and say, you know, this is what they said about me. These are the things, because we all will, will, will die, will Sometimes you maybe even have the opportunity to have last words. Um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, this was his last words on his deathbed. Remember Leonardo da Vinci? Well, you don't because he, he was dead before you got, came around. But we all know studying him and all that. Here's what, what he said. I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Wow, what a workaholic, huh? Socrates, smartest man Potentially to ever live, Socrates says this, Credo, we owe a rooster to Asclepios, pay it, and do not neglect it. Then he died. Isn't that interesting? 
I heard a whole podcast on this one. It sounds so minimal, but you know what he's saying here? I believe in the afterlife. That's what he's saying. I want to make sure my debts are cleared. I'm dying. Uh, see, I got everything covered. The rooster. Would you make sure that we, we pay somebody off? We owe them a rooster. Isn't that interesting? Tombstone, Arizona has some great ones. If you go to Tombstone, there's a graveyard there. I don't know how factual some of these things are, but I think some of them are actually, the, they're, they're factual. They actually wrote these things about people. Here's one in Tombstone. Um, this is, um, let's see, this guy's Frank Bowles, okay? Frank Bowles. If you're related to him, I'm so sorry. But here's, here's what it says. As you pass by, remember that as you are, so we was, and as I am, you soon will be, remember me. A little philosopher there in Tombstone, Arizona. Let's do another one. This is, this is one. I like this one. Uh, George Johnson doesn't, but it says, here lies George Johnson, hanged by mistake. He was right, I was wrong, but we strung him up, and now he's gone. All right. Isn't that, isn't that terrible? What's, what are they going to say about you? At the end of the day, what are they going to say? Hopefully, as Jesus followers, they will give glory to God. I'm not really here, and you shouldn't be here to leave some type of a legacy other than to give God glory. At the end of the day, no matter how well you live your life, there will be times, sadly, when nobody will remember that you even lived. They'll forget. But if you pour into people the message of Jesus, that will, that will live on. That will linger. Paul, we come to these last farewell words that he gives to those elders in Ephesus, Acts 20, 17 through 38. For those of you that are in the room, men, and you're, you're interested in maybe being an elder someday, a leader of leaders in the church, he's addressing these elders. I believe he's addressing these elders um, twofold. Number one, he, he loves them, but also he's addressing them because he wants them to follow his example. He does want them to be like him, to say, this is how you're supposed to live your life. There are some great, great passages about what it means to be an elder. Uh, Timothy, Paul talks to, but this is a great one right here, and we're going to look at it, and I'm going to read it in its entirety. Those of you that are not seeking to be an elder someday, you still are going to learn from this. Those of you that, that men and women, you're here, this is, these are great words, no matter, no matter where you're coming at it, these are powerful words for any Jesus follower to follow. I'm going to read it, and you can follow along. Now from Meletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink back declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and inflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone in tears, with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I covet no one's silver 
or gold or apparel, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and they kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that, he, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. It's a powerful, powerful speech, very emotional. You can feel it. As you read these words, you can sense these elders hanging on every word, this leader that they love so much and are never going to see again. And Paul gets the opportunity to share with them face-to-face these words, not just in a letter, <coughs> but face-to-face. First thing I want to tell you today, I'm going to give you five. First thing I'm going to tell you today that we learned from this, I have finished what God told me to do. I have finished what God told me to do. At the end of the day, your life, my life, that's all that it really matters. This is an overarching point, that you have finished all that God told you to do. You know, I found that, that it is important to answer this question in life. What has God called you to do today? Not so much, what has God called you to do in 10 years or 20 years? What's God called you to do today? What's the assignment that God has given to you? Think about that for a moment. Write it down if you're taking notes. What has God called you to do? You're responsible to fulfill the assignments Jesus has given to you. Did you know that? You're responsible to fulfill those things, what he's called you to do. Now, for those of you that may be like Leonardo da Vinci, you may be kind of workaholics, and you think God has given you everything to do. And you weep about people that are going away hungry right now, and you're You're fearful about this job not getting done and that job not getting done. And when you look at our city, you think, how in the world can I meet all the needs? That's not all your assignment. Here's one lesson I found as a minister, and it took me a long time to figure this out, and sometimes it still creeps back. I can't fix you. And sometimes I I, I grieve a little bit because I see sometimes people not moving forward in their faith. And I put it on me. Get this, you may not know this or not, but I'm not God. If you don't believe that, ask my wife. She'll, she'll fill you in. <clears throat> I'm not. Get this, parents. Your assignment is to be the best parent you can be, but your assignment also isn't to fix your kids. Your kids are going to be your kids. And if you have four kids, they're all going to be different. If you have five kids, they're all going to be different. Some of them may follow Jesus, some may not, but your assignment is to be a parent and to live a godly life, but your job isn't necessarily to fix your kids. Did you know that? That should... That should feel good on some of your parents. You've been worrying about that. Your assignment isn't to fix your kids. We have a lot of assignments in life that God gives us throughout, but those are the only things that we're called to be. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, that we are to be found faithful stewards. It doesn't say necessarily faithful owners. Do you know that, who the owner is of everything? God. And you know what we do? We've given things, and we're called the steward. We're called the steward, the money that, that, are, that is his. It's, it's all his, right? So the money I get, I'm, I'm called to steward that. And, and the time that he gives me, it's his time. I've given him my life, so I steward that. The relationships that he gives me are his relationships, but I steward that as best I can. And that, that should help you to understand that, wow, the load's off me. It's on, on him. He's the one that owns it all. I'm called to do the thing that he's given to me. When he tells Adam in the garden to to do this, he's giving up a part of the garden, and he says, tend the garden. But he's not going to tend the whole garden. He was given an assignment to have, and he did that. And and we're all called to tend the garden, the part of the garden that God has given to us. Now, know this. On the flip side, there's those that think they have no responsibility. It's like, you know, I just, I don't even really know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to get up and... See what's on Netflix, and we're going to move on and kind of live my life. And there are some people that only live three hours at a time. 
You know, it's like, okay, I'm not sure from 10 to 1, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do What has God called you to do? God has given us all an assignment. One of the best things you can do in the morning is to, is to start with hearing God's voice and to hear him, what he has to say. So we only are given 24 hours. So today, what was your assignment? Today, I hope you woke up and said, I want to hear God today. And God will speak to all of us. You know that God, in this room, he'll speak to you. If you're not a believer, he'll speak to you. Open up the Bible, start reading, he's speaking to you. You may not listen. You may not hear it because the Holy Spirit isn't within you yet. But those of us that are Jesus followers, he speaks. And that's an assignment that we all have. So what's your assignment? At the end of the day, that is really the big overarching question for our life is, what is the assignment? I remember I had an assignment to be a youth pastor in a season of my life. And, and there was an assignment that I had. And the youth ministry was growing. And I needed about 10 couples to help. And, and I, I started looking for people on Sunday morning that were just kind of hanging out in the lobby. So I picked, I picked couples to help with the middle schoolers that I believe would be good. And one couple, I remember, I wanted Kathy Harima to work with the middle school girls. John Harima was a landscaper, and quite frankly, I've told John this, if he's listening. Hi, John. But the, the reality is, John, I, I wasn't as interested in John leading as I was Kathy. But they liked doing things together. They didn't have any kids yet. So I picked them both. And he's like, what do I do? I said, well, your job is the middle school boys. At the time, I was teaching middle school boys on Sunday morning, and I was looking forward to John taking that off my plate. I love middle school boys, but they were quiet. John was quiet. I figured it was a good match. And they could sit there for an hour and just look at each other. And so John took that assignment, and here's what happened in John's life. He loved it. Remember one time he invited me over to his house. I went over on a Friday night. And he has a lanai out there in Florida. And I thought there were monkeys jumping in this lanai. It was just 40 middle school boys jumping around, jumping in pool. I think one of them was jumping off the roof. It could have been, you know, uh, you know but, it, it, but maybe it was just my eyes. But they were just jumping everywhere. John Harama took that ministry to boys, and he started a ministry called Big Life Sports. At the time, he was just a landscaper. He started Big Life Sports, went all around the world doing that. And now it's, it's big life, and you can put a slash, an underslash, underscore, whatever country, big underscore Afghanistan, underscore Yemen, underscore whatever, all over the world. He has ministries and is starting churches. He has more people involved in big life than if you put 10 mega churches in America together. And he is still as quiet and is still as humble as he was back then. My assignment was to ask Kathy and John to help, and his assignment from God is to go change the world, and he did, and he is doing it. You can pray for, for big life ministries, one of the greatest ministries in the world right now. There are people in that ministry every year that are persecuted for their faith. I remember a couple years ago, I talked to them, they lost four pastors, heads cut off, martyred for their faith. John Harima is doing his assignment. All I did was my assignment, which was to ask him. You know what? Here's the thing. God takes our little assignment, and he expands the kingdom when we say yes. And you, by not saying yes, can actually, can actually miss an opportunity to be blessed by God to expand the kingdom. And know this. If you have for a moment to think that God's kingdom is revolving around you and your, and your yes, I would give that one up. God's kingdom is going to expand with or without you. He will just pick somebody else. But you will miss the blessing on seeing the full abundance of what God has for you. So say yes to the assignment. Number two, verse 20, I told the truth. How did, I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house. Verse 20, verse 27, I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. What is this shrink back? I was at my uh, brother and sister-in-law's house last week. They just got a pet tortoise. And the tortoise is a great picture of what this passage is talking about. I looked, and as soon as I bent down to see the tortoise, you know what that head did? It shrunk back underneath that shell. And I'm so glad it did because that's what this passage means right here. I did not go back into my shell. The picture of this 
Sometimes what we have is when we're, we're at a lunchroom or we're at school or we have an opportunity with a family member to share Jesus Christ, what he's saying is when times got tough, I did not shrink back into the shell. I stayed out and I, per, I, I pursued truth and I told you truth. And there are a lot of times when people shrink back. They shrink back for a lot of reasons. Number one reason is people pleasing. We don't want people to be upset with us. What would my sister think if I shared Jesus with her? What would would my husband or wife think if I shared Jesus with them like this? What what would my coworker think if I shared Jesus? And so we shrink back, and here's what Paul says, I didn't shrink back. J.I. Packer says this, Paul, in his own estimation, was not a philosopher, not a moralist, not the world's wisest man, but simply Christ's herald. Paul's royal, Paul's royal master has given him a message to proclaim. His whole business, therefore, was to deliver that message with exact and studious faithfulness. He added nothing. He altered nothing. He omitted nothing. Let me ask you this. Do you shrink back from declaring the full counsel of God with people that you love? Paul says, I didn't. I don't. Those of you that are here that are not believers and you're tired and tired and tired of people talking about God to you. Know this. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They may sometimes not do it necessarily in love, but we do the best we can. You know why? Because the Bible tells us to tell you about things that really matter. And Paul says, I didn't shrink back from it. I told the truth. Does your presentation of Jesus flow out of you, not just with truth, but also in love and tears and empathy. Paul says here, I was with you in tears. I did not cease to admonish you night and day with tears. We are to have tears. We are to be proclaiming it with love, not just in truth. We've met people that just proclaim Jesus with truth, without love, and that means nothing. But we do it because we love you. I remember one time, there was a friend of mine that, that, that was a coach of mine in high school, and he, I didn't know if he was a believer, and God got a hold of me at, at 1 a.m. I just saw him all day. 1 a.m., I'm in Fort Worth. I drive all the way to Dallas where he is in the middle of the night with tears on my eyes to tell him about Jesus, and it was not me. It was God saying, you better go, and I went, and I talked to him, and he knew that, I knew that he had accepted Christ early on in life, and it was such a blessing to me to be able to know that he had, and then to be able to follow up with my life into his life and to help him move forward and to understand who Jesus is. Because, because it's important for all of us to go to bed at night and know there is no blood, there no blood, no blood on my hands. I've told everybody that I could about Jesus. I told the truth. Is there somebody that you haven't told the truth to? And when I say truth, I'm not just talking about just truth like T, like small T. I'm talking about capital T, Jesus Christ truth, talking about Jesus. Charles Spurgeon says this, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let it not, let not one person go unwarned and unprayed for. Picture here is, if they go to hell, let our arms be wrapped around their legs. Do you have that passion to share Jesus with people that are close to you? With me, my passion is high sometimes, and then it wanes if you're like me. And then sometimes it goes up, and sometimes it goes down. This past week, I was convicted doing this message that I don't do enough to tell the people that God has assigned to me about Jesus. And I need to to do a better job in praying and, 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 and going and putting myself in positions to make sure that they know about Jesus. And you say, well, what, what happens if they don't take it correctly? That's not your job. You can't convert anybody. All your job is, is to tell the truth. Number three, I serve Jesus with humility, Paul said. I serve the Lord with all humility and with tears, with trials. Paul says, uh, I am a man of humility. The word humility here is used 200 times in the Bible. It's almost always considered of virtue. Back then, though, the term lowly, which is also a term that we see in Matthew 11, is this lowly. In other words, you're putting yourself low. In that culture, it is not considered a virtue in that culture to put yourself low. You put yourself high. You don't put yourself low. And what, what Jesus did, what Paul did, 
is they put themselves low. Let me ask you this, men. Are you, when you, when you look at your life and the people around you look at your life, would they say this? That is the most gentle and lowly man I know. Ask yourself that. I can't always say that I'm gentle and lowly, but here's the thing. When I see times in my life when I'm not, that's when I know I am not being Christ-like because at the core of Jesus' heart is a man that is typified with the character of gentle and lowly. If you really want to boil it down, who Jesus really is, those of you that are seeking the Lord, you need to know this. At the core of who Jesus is, you find the most gentle and lowly human that ever walked the earth. He was fully human and fully God, and he was gentle and lowly. Dane Ortland, in the book that we are, we've given out to you for free, you can get a copy today, Gentle and Lowly. I haven't got past the second chapter, by the way. I've already read it once. I'm reading it through it again, second chapter. One part of it says this, Jesus Christ is the most, a hu- most approachable human that ever walked the earth. Are you approachable? If you're not approachable, you might not be gentle and lowly. And if you're not gentle and lowly, where do you go? You go to Jesus. There you find one that is gentle and lowly. Let me ask you this. When you think about ministers throughout your lifetime, would you consider ministers, pastors to be gentle and lowly? That's a tough one for me to preach, but I got to tell you, I'm speaking to you as, as me to elders right now, okay? Those of you men that are listening and want to be an elder, let me ask you this. Do you want to be gentle and lowly for the rest of your life? Do you want to put your own needs aside? Do you want to put people above yourself? When, when everybody else turns their back on you, are you okay with God and are you okay with being humble? You say, well, when does that happen? Let me, I'm going to tell you, it happened to Jesus all the time. Jesus was gentle and lowly to all kinds of people, and they would, they would do things to him and say things, and they turn their back on him. To be, a, to be an elder, to be a leader, to be a leader in the church, it is not, it is not something you attain to. It is something that God does in you and through you as you humble yourself, and thee he exalts. You see, he's not looking for those that are really able to do the job. He's looking for your availability. One person said to me, not looking for your ability, he's looking for your availability. He's looking for, he's looking for you to just say, here I am, here am I. Here am I, send me. So when you look at your life, do you see humility? Number four, finish strong. Used to be a distance runner. I know it's hard to believe sometimes. I'm going to get back in shape. I think I think I am. I put that I think in there because, you know, some of you are like, I'll keep you accountable. Not yet, okay? I'm thinking about it. I'm praying about it. I want to get back in shape. I want to, I want to do a, a race. Today I was motivated by Luke. He was talking about doing a 10K. Luke, I hope, I hope maybe next year, maybe we'll do that 10K together, okay? I want to do that. But I'll tell you this. I know a lot about running because I used to do it a lot. And I know this. It's not enough to start a marathon. You got to finish it. It's not enough to start it. You know, the mile is one of the hardest races. And there are some races when I used to go out and I'd go out and I'd lead it. I remember one race I was leading world class runners and I led them for two laps. I finished that race last, but I led them for two laps. But when they, when they put the, the, the times up there and hook last place, there was quite a gap between first and last. And, and you can't go home and say, you know what, I'll tell you what, I, I, led, I led Steve Scott for, for two laps, you know? You, you barely finished the race, Brian. You know, I think a lot of Jesus followers get real excited when you accept Jesus Christ, but when you said you gave everything to him, and, and you gave everything to him, and you say, listen, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you lead me, that sounds really good to start the race, but you know what, some of you are now in the second lap and third lap, and it's getting tough. I just want you to know, if you sign up for this, this is to finish the race. He wants you to finish the race, not just start it. So here's what I, I like to do. I, I'm not looking at the entirety of life, but our lives are typically in seasons, chapters. What chapter are you on? Those of you that are moms, you may be in a chapter of stay-at-home mom. You used to work uh, outside the house, now you're inside the house. The chapter you're on right now is to be a stay-at-home mom, and that is a really, really hard chapter, isn't it? Career ladies have kids, all of a sudden you're at home. This little kid that's not talking to you, that's a tough chapter. Finish that race. 
Finish that race strong because there will be a time when you wish for that time when it's just you and that little boy. Finish strong. And then guess what? They're going to move on and they're going to go to high school and they're going to go to college. And now you've got this man that you haven't really talked to in 20 years and it's just you and him again. Finish that season strong of being an empty nester. Finish strong. And then these grandkids are going to come around and no longer you the mom. Don't be the mom. Be the grandmom. Don't try to raise those little kids. That's, the, that's your daughter's job. That's your son's job. It's your job to give them a bunch of candy and leave. Finish that race strong. Don't be, don't be too in their business. Just be the grandma. Finish strong. Men, you thought, well, he's going to leave me alone. No, no, I'm not. Finish strong in the season that you're in. If you're in college or you're getting your master's, finish strong. Finish strong. College students, finish strong. Kids, when you're taking the test and you're halfway through the semester, finish strong. If you're getting A's, say, well, good, I'm going to coast now. I could probably get a C. No, finish that strong. Men, you know, you know the age that most men leave their wives? You say 30, 40, 55. 55. So that seems kind of old. There's so many people that have their kids, and they, they, they have their kids, they're, they're living for their kids, and then they're able to endure it maybe a couple more years, and they get all the kids out, and all of a sudden, that, that younger person that was your secretary looks really attractive, and your wife may not have all the looks that she used to have. You know what you do? You leave her. You get yourself a nice sports car. Start hitting the gym again. Been a while. Maybe go to a tanning booth. It's a nice haircut. He said, I'm not speaking to you. I'm just speaking in the entirety of life. I've seen men in their 50s blow it. They were almost there, and they left their wife for some young model, and they blew it. They blew it with their kids. They blew it with their grandkids. Finish strong. Because there will be a day when everybody looks back on your life, and those things are defining moments. Those slip-ups are defining moments for your kids and your grandkids. Paul says, finish strong. So we're not looking at this vague entirety of life. We're talking about the seasons you're in, the season you're in right now, the day that you're in, the week that you're in, the months that you're in. Finish strong, right? Did you agree to that? Anybody? Got two or three of you. We, we, let's finish strong. Let's be people that, that, that run this race and finish the race that God has given to us and not give in to pain or fatigue or divided hearts in our lives because there will always be times when we can divide and we can say, you know what, this is what God says, but I'm going to choose to do this. Don't do that. Don't be divided. Finish strong. Life is not a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. And it's a series of marathons. And some of you right now, you're in a series of marathons. But right now, let me, know, let me just tell you this. God is faithful to stay with you daily as you walk by faith. He will give you the strength. It's called grace. He gives you the, the grace to make it. In your marriage, in your school, in your relationships. Martin Luther says this. This is how he lived his life. This day and then that day. That's how he lived his life. This day that I have, this day, this 24-hour period, this is the day that I'm going to live. I'm going to finish strong with in mind that day. That day when I stand before the Lord and I hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. So how do you do all this? How do you wrap your mind around it? This day, you got 24 hours, finish strong with this day. With in mind that day, this day will matter. Know this too, when you're thinking about doing that incredibly, incredibly bad deed, sin, that you know that could shatter your life, know that this day matters on that day. This day. Live this day with that day in view. And then Paul says this, I gave more than I took in life. I gave more than I took. Verse 30, from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things. To draw away the disciples after them. And then verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. Paul is saying here, not just I'm working a job, but he's saying everything that I do, I give out more than I get. It is better to give 
than to receive. That's not just a money thing. That's just in everything. Paul, throughout his life, he believed it was better to give than to receive. In your marriage, here's some great marital advice for you from somebody that fails a lot in it and sometimes does it right. It is better to give than to receive. Man, that means, you want that romantic night? It starts at the dishwasher. It starts, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. That's right, mopping the floor. I'll try that someday. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> mopping the floor. Doing the laundry. Oh, I hate that. Folding the socks. Oh. It begins there. Better to give than receive. In your friendships, it's better to give than receive. When you show up sometimes in a small group, you know, there's sometimes when it needs to be about you. It is. There's some days where it should be. But you know what? When you go to that small group, it's better to give than to receive. Better to show up and say, I got to be there. I don't necessarily feel like going, but I got to be there because it's better to give than to receive. Paul, I believe, got it somewhat. I believe Paul got it somewhat. Paul would show up at a place and he would give it all, but there would be somebody there for him. And there would be uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and there would be somebody that would be in Rome as he got there. There were dear brothers, and Paul somewhat got it. He somewhat got the idea of living this life completely giving with nothing in return. But you know the one that gets it better than Paul? You know the one that really shows us more than anybody else? Jesus. Jesus. You see, Paul is an incredible example for us to follow, but, but, but Paul was always looking to Jesus. On the night before he died, Jesus, he washed the disciples' feet. If I was about to die tomorrow, and I know it's coming, and we're having a meeting, I might, I'm just telling you, I might make it a little about me. I'm going to die tomorrow, I'm going to make it a little about me. This is what he does. He takes a basin and he takes a towel, and he washes the disciples' feet. Jesus gives more than he received. Judas, Judas, on the night before I die, if somebody's going to turn their back on me and I know it's coming, I might not give you an invite. He's there, and he does it to show us that this life that we live, it's not about us, it's about Jesus. And only Jesus can give you the power and the grace to be able to do this. Only Jesus can do it. I'm speaking to those of you that may be looking at being a leader someday and what it looks like. And Paul gives us a great example of this. As we look through this, think about your life. How you doing with your assignment that God's given to you? Are you telling the truth to those who don't know Jesus? Are you telling the truth? Are you telling people about Jesus. It says here in this passage that there is no blood on Paul's hands. He says, there is nobody that can look at me and say, you didn't tell somebody about Jesus. Let me ask you, is there anybody in your life right now, as you think about it, is there anybody in your life you would say, you know what, I never really told that person about Jesus. I'm not saying come to church with me. I'm saying that that Jesus Christ is God's son and that God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die for you. That if you believe in him, you can have every lasting life. Would you like to trust Jesus right now? Is there somebody in, in your life where you've, 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 you've not done that to? A son or a daughter? A parent? Let me tell you what I'd do. I would not let today go by unless I did it. I wouldn't. Because isn't that really the, the assignment that really matters most? That the people that God has put in our lives know that the only thing that really matters is Jesus. And I would encourage you to do that. It might not be today. You, you say, it's not possible, but I am meeting with them next week. I can make a make a, an appointment with them, great. I just know that in my heart, in my life, sometimes when it burns me so much, I do it then. I do it then because I don't want to live with that. Paul didn't. <laughs> Not at all. Paul didn't at all. 
He said, I am innocent of the blood of all. What a great testimony. Let me ask you this. Are you humble? Are you living a humble life? Are you gentle and lowly? Ask the Lord to change that in your life if that's not the case. Is it about you or is it about him? Is life about you or about him? It says here that he was humble. Are you finishing these seasons strong in your life? Are you giving out more than you're taking? Paul gives us an excellent funeral sermon. I think all of us would be, would be wise to start writing it now. Start writing our sermon now, whatever that is. You know, we write our funeral sermons, don't we? It's with our lives. The saddest sermons I have to do sometimes is like, I don't know if the person's a believer. Actually, let me back up. The hardest sermon to preach is knowing they're not a believer. That's the hardest one. You know what I do with them? I go right past you. I'm sorry. I don't talk about all the, he was a great softball player. He used to serve pizza on Friday night. Wow, he told incredible jokes. I go right past you, and you know where I go? Right to Jesus. Right to Jesus. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you can take care of that right now. We all, we all will die and face the judgment. All of us, we will look. And, and the Lord will, will either say, you're in Or you're not, and it will be based upon not whether you went to church or not, or ask great questions about the faith. It will be, what did you do with Jesus? Do you know him, or do you not? So today, if you would, bow your head. Let's not wait. Let's nail it down now. I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to bow your head and... If you don't know Jesus, just to, you can pray this prayer in your heart right now. Dear Father, I don't know you. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against others. And right now, I turn from that sin and I turn to you. Dear Father, I believe that you sent your only son for me to die for me in my place. And right now, I give him my life. Lord, I want to I want to finish strong. Your Father, please come into my life and save me. I pray this in your name. Amen.